Another example, pseudogenes. So pseudogenes are genes which look pretty good. The computer for a little while might say, ah, that one might be working, but then when you look really closely, you can see the pseudogene has suffered some kind of a fatal flaw. And they come in various flavors. But some of them are looking pretty good, except maybe they have what you call a frame shift or a nonsense mutation, something that absolutely knocks out function. Now when you look around the genome, you can find lots of places uh, where the same genes occur in the same order in multiple species. In fact, that's usually the rule. If you look for gene A, B, and C in the human, and then you go and look in the chimp, and you find A and C, you'll almost always find B in between. And even if you go to the dog or the mouse, you're very likely to find that as well. Another argument, I think, for common ancestry, although one could also argue that there's some reason why they have to be in these orders. But occasionally, and now we have the genome sequences, we can look and see how often this happens. And it's, it's not a huge number of times, but it's, it's a number. You have a situation like this, same order of genes in dog and chimp and human, but you look very carefully at that middle gene, and it's a pseudogene. It has recently, uh, if you just look at molecular clock arguments, encountered an inactivating mutation that has rendered it no longer functional. And some of these genes are probably important, actually, for human functioning. You know, the idea that humans developed new characteristics by gains of function may not always be true. Sometimes you need to jettison a few things in order to be able uh, to acquire some new characteristic. And there are good examples of that that people have pointed to. For instance, the, the, the jaw muscles. There's a gene, a myo-16, which is an important protein uh, for jaw muscles. In fact, many primates uh, have very powerful jaws, and that protein is very important. We humans have a pseudogene for that particular uh, protein. We don't make that one. And when you look anatomically, you can see that our jaw muscles are much less powerful, and some have even proposed that that might have given a chance for the skull uh, to grow larger and accommodate a larger brain. That's a bit fanciful, but it's been proposed. Now, how do you explain this kind of finding on the basis of multiple acts of special creation? It's very difficult to do that, unless you're going to postulate that God wanted to test our faith, and so he put a pseudogene right there in the place where evolution would have predicted it to mislead us. That's not a comfortable conclusion uh, for me. When I think of God's omnipotence and his creative genius, the idea that he would also be a bit of a trickster, it doesn't feel right. And there are may, so many other examples like this that it, it really doesn't feel right. A third example. If you look across our genome, and just ask, are there things here that happen a lot? I mean, sequences that are repeated over and over again? Well, yeah, about 50% of our DNA uh, is made up of these repetitive elements. Some of them probably have function, but I, I would doubt very much that all of them have important functions. And there's a class of those that you can tell are actually quite diverged from each other, which implies that they're quite old. And when you look at that class at different species, you can even see that same class of elements popping up in the same place in other mammals. So if this is a human uh, set of uh, genes, again, this A, B, and C in that order, you might go and look at the mouse. Again, you'd be likely to find A, B, and C in the same order. Uh, in this uh, particular circumstance, if you go looking for those repetitive elements, you'd be likely to find some of those in the same places. Not all, because things have been perhaps coming and going a bit. If you looked at one of them, uh, like this one in my little diagram here, uh, you would find this ancient repetitive element, uh, which is repeated many times in the genome, has about the same similarity between human and mouse as the sequence on either side, a uh, sequence in this case not of a gene but of some space or DNA. So how did that get there, and why is it in the same place? And particularly, if you look hard enough, you can find some of these where that repetitive element actually didn't land properly. These are transposed, and sometimes when they're transposed, there's a break that occurs right as it's trying to insert itself, and you end up with a decapitated repetitive element, which has only part of its sequence, and is, which is completely devoid of function. And what do you know? When you go and look at some of those, you find that this very same decapitated element with the breakpoint in the same place occurs in that homologous segment of human and mouse. Again, it's hard for me to imagine what's going on here if it's not an indication of a common ancestor, in this case, a common ancestor of mammals. So, that's the data. Now, 
Again, I think as believers, uh, we should look carefully at that. Uh, we should rest upon the rock of the faith that we have been given. And we should consider what the options are uh, for the ways in which this can be all integrated. Some of our colleagues have chosen this option, as you all know. And they are beating us up because they perceive that we're running away uh, from the facts, some of which I have just shown you. And I don't think that is necessarily going to be a good strategy, particularly if what we're trying to do is to not only defend the faith, but also to draw other people to it. But atheism is out there, and it's getting more shrill by the, by the minute. Richard Dawkins, uh, the primary proponent in my field of this, has a book coming out in October called The God Delusion. You can tell where that's going to go. And of course, uh, he is, throughout the course of his incredibly articulate writing career, have been making this case against faith going well outside the evidence that he could derive from science to make comments in areas that science uh, really does not have much to offer, uh, namely about uh, the truth or falsity of faith. He says, faith is blind trust in the absence of evidence, even the teeth of evidence. So Dawkins is very successful in painting a caricature of faith. Does that sound like your faith? It doesn't sound like mine. Uh, he paints it that way and then he dismantles it. And a lot of our scientific colleagues are carried right along without realizing what's happened there that the faith that he has described is not one uh, that we would all embrace anyway. So I would say as an argument against that perspective, we're on very firm footing on pure logical grounds. If God exists, God is not entirely enclosed within nature. Science is the way that we investigate nature and that's all that science can do. And therefore, science is completely unable, on purely logical grounds, uh, to exclude the possibility of God. And one who makes that stance has just committed a major logical error. I find that carries a fair amount of weight. And maybe because I used to be an atheist myself and it carried weight with me, I, I, uh, I see that as a particularly uh, powerful argument to bring to the table when you're having that kind of a discussion with somebody who's heard a little too much Richard Dawkins and, uh, and bought into it. So I actually think we're on very strong footing here uh, to be able to defend against that claim. Evolution does not demand atheism. Uh, it, it absolutely uh, doesn't, doesn't even belong in the same sentence. Of course, many of our colleagues are more likely, uh, instead of being strong atheists saying, I know there is no God, um, to say, well, I'm just not sure. I don't think there's any way to know. And of course, that can be a legitimate position if it has been put in the context of considering the evidence. But most of the agnostics I know are agnostics because they just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> it's not that they've considered the evidence and found it wanting, it's that they have not really had the evidence put in front of them. And again, I think those who decide to take that path, again, I'm speaking from personal experience, often surprise themselves by being converted. And, uh, that's what we should try to encourage people to do. And I think we should point out to an agnostic that you would not admire somebody who said the age of the universe is unknowable if they'd never considered the evidence. So why would you admire somebody who says the existence of God is unknowable if they'd never considered the evidence?